One of the most important verses in Scripture is in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. I think it's one of the most important verses generally, but for the time and age in which we live, I consider it to be absolutely crucial, absolutely vital. Turn with me, please, to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. That your love may abound more and more. Your agape, that is the love of God, may abound. And that it may abound more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Real knowledge is knowledge of God's word. We live in an age of apostasy in much of the evangelical church probably in the Western world, unfortunately and tragically, in most of it, in most of it. And in the political correctness of the secular world that has infiltrated the body of Christ, there's been a tendency to make discernment and truth and love mutually exclusive. That if you tell the truth or say something is not right or something's not scriptural or you behave in a manner of discerning and a discerning manner. People will say you're judgmental, you're critical, you're unloving. They have made love and truth mutually exclusive when in fact God has made love and truth mutually dependent. As we've often pointed out, the Lord Jesus never once, never once compromised truth in the name of love. He told people difficult things in love, but he told them difficult things because he loved them. He told the woman at the well, as soon as she began with her false doctrine, you have this mountain, we have that mountain, and you know, the, you, the Jews have Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and we have this mountain, Har Gerizim, Mount Gerizim. Before he went any further in the conversation, he corrected her wrong doctrine. Salvation comes from the Jews. Corrected her wrong doctrine immediately. Or again, the <clears throat> Syrophoenician woman with the demonized little girl. Please help my daughter. I can't give the children's food to, to dogs. Now in Greek it's diminutive. It's like puppies, almost a term of affection. It would sound like a racist statement in modern speak. But what Jesus was really saying is, you're a pagan. I'd like to help you, but your religion is unfit for human consumption. What you believe is dog food. It's not the bread of life. It's not fit for human consumption. Mormonism is not fit for human consumption. Islam is not fit for human consumption. Talmudic Judaism is not fit for human consumption. Jehovah's Witness teachings are not fit for human consumption. They're dog food. Therefore, <laughs> the derogatory term for dog is for, is for a non-believer in biblical Hebrew, dogs surround me. In Psalm 22, dogs, klavim, means vivoti. Dogs surround me. Uh, it's a derogatory term. You're a human being made in God's image and likeness. You're a magio dei. Why are you eating like a dog? That's what you're doing if you're believing in false religion. The spiritual food you eat is not fit for human consumption. Very strong words. Now Jesus loved that little Syrophoenician girl and he did indeed heal her and drive the demon out of her, but first he made her mother deal with the truth. What you believe is false. He made the woman at the well deal with the truth. He never once compromised truth in the name of love. Because he loved, he told people the truth. He told them the truth in love, but he told them the truth. Such it is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for your mercy, for your kindness, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection the promise of your son's return, and for the power of his spirit. Speak to us now, Lord God, from your word, by your spirit. More than this, Heavenly Father, we ask you for the wisdom and courage, as always, to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
We're looking today at the subject of the holy kiss. The holy kiss. Look with me, please, to Romans chapter 16. Verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ, of the Messiah, greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 85. Verse 10. Loving kindness, that is chesed, grace, and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. Chesed b'shamayim nishkaf. Amet ma'aretz titzmoch. Chesed ve'amet nishkachu. They kiss each other. Grace and truth kiss each other. That is what springs from the earth, and what springs from heaven, the holy kiss, they kiss each other. Truth means nothing without grace. Jesus came in grace and truth. He rules the world with truth and grace, as the Christmas carol we sang today. Truth means nothing without grace. I live in Great Britain. In Northern Ireland, there are political Protestants even evangelical Protestants who are in this conflict with Roman Catholic community over Irish independence. Everything those people say about the Roman Catholic Church is true. Everything they say about the papacy is true. Everything. How false it is, how unbiblical, how corrupt, how historically diabolical it is. Everything those people say about the Roman Catholic Church is true. But when they say it, they're not aiming at the Catholic Church. They're aiming at Catholic people. <laughs> There's a big difference. There's no grace in it. My family is a mixture of Catholic and Jewish. I know Catholicism is wrong. I'm going to see my mother in a few days. She's trusting in a scapula instead of in the Lord Jesus. They have Jewish family the same. They trust in Talmudic Judaism, a counterfeit Judaism of the rabbis, a completely counterfeit Judaism that rejects its own Messiah. But I've known Christians who address this, but they're not addressing Talmudic Judaism. They're not saying it because they love Jews and want Jews to be saved. They're simply using it as a theological justification for anti-Semitism <laughs> or anti-Catholic. Not anti-Catholicism, but anti-Catholic people. Where's the grace? What you're saying may be true. Talmudic Judaism is false. Roman Catholicism is false. You have a false Christianity and a false Judaism. As I told you, I've told many people, I, as a kid in New York, I went to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I've seen a, a false Judaism and a false Christianity. Completely false. But I love the people. <laughs> I have no problem telling people the religions are false, but I want to tell them that because I love the people. When you're simply taking it, a truth and using it as ammunition, <laughs> that's not grace and truth. That's not the way we're supposed to be. It's supposed to be a holy kiss. Grace and truth are supposed to meet each other. Let's begin at the beginning. The holy kiss and the kiss of death. Look with me, please, first of all, before we begin, to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. Yeah. 
For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now it is done with laser instrumentation. But at one time it was done with a surgical micrometer, with leukemia patients requiring marrow transplants to get erythrocytes stored in the marrow of large bones like the femur and fibula. Osteocytes, bone cells, die, die stain like a yellowish white. The marrow, the erythrocytes with the erythrocyte, the, the red cell concentration, dye stains something like this, a maroon. But when the two kinds of tissue come together, it's like rust color. Where does the marrow end and the bone begin? Where does the bone end and the marrow begin? Determined by a surgical instrument, a surgical micrometer, to harvest the marrow in order to implant the erythrocytes into certain kinds of leukemia patients. I recall in England we helped sponsor this kind of surgery for children who were from Chernobyl, and their skin was as white as this board <laughs> due to a red cell deficiency because of what happened to them with the radioactive poisoning. It was absolutely terrible. In any event, the relationship between the soul and spirit is analogous to this, the scripture says. Where does one end, where does one begin? Remember, we are tripartite beings, body, soul, and spirit. Eastern religion, secular psychology, okay, uh, basically say we're two-dimensional beings. That the spiritual functions of man are functions of the soul, what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. No, 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 no. Our spirit is as distinct from our soul as our soul is from our physical anatomy. Our spirit is as different from our emotions and our intellect as our emotions and intellect are different from our eyelashes or fingernails. They're that different. We are tripartite. We are three-dimensional, not two. In Eastern religion, it's two. In secular psychology, it's two. We're simply apes with better DNA. It's predicated on Darwinistic presupposition. So it's always three because we're made in God's image and likeness. God is triune, so he makes us that way. Well, is that prophecy, is that really the Holy Spirit communicating to your spirit, or is it just your mind? As Jeremiah said, they prophesy from the futility and deception of their own mind. It doesn't have to be a demon, it could just be someone's own mind. How do you know? Is that a real tongue or just gibberish? Is that a real word of knowledge? How do you know? Is the Holy Spirit really telling you to say that? Is that really a revelation from God? How do you know? The first and foremost way we know is does it agree with Scripture doctrinally? If it doesn't, you can throw the rest of it out. Only once it passes that litmus test can you weigh it and see if your spirit bears witness with it and so forth and look at it rationally, but if it's contradictory to Scripture doctrinally, throw it out, it's absolute rubbish. Again, I've warned so much of what today passes for charismata is simply clairvoyance. It's, it's not scriptural. I've also warned about the Korean, well, he's now a convicted swindler, sentenced to three and a half years, Young Yi Chao. And people in the West were impressed by him because he had a big church. Well, I spend a lot of time in the Far East. I just get back from the Far East. There's far bigger visualization cults in the Far East than his. You can go to Macau. Macau is like the uh, Las Vegas of Asia. And you'll see people going up to the little baldy, the little monk, and buy sticks of incense and give him money. And they'll visualize winning at the roulette table. <laughs> and they'll, med they'll visualize it with the incense. And then they'll go into the casino and they'll come out broke anyway, but <laughs> the casino makes money, the monk makes money, but the, 
the gambler's a loser. You know? That's, this idea of your imagination is your spirit. Well, this was actually taught in the book, The Fourth Dimension, by this convicted swindler, Young Yi Chao. He's criminally convicted in court. He's a swindler, so is his son. He said, your subconscious imagination is your spirit. You visualize what you want, and then you claim it by faith, using the Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland word faith, positive confession thing. You picture what you want and claim it. And he writes in the book that Hindus and Buddhists have known this for centuries. Now Jesus Christ has shown it to him. Well, I do not know if that man, I've said this before, I do not know if that man was a Christian or not, but I know he's a Buddhist. By his own confession, he was teaching shamanism. He was teaching mystical Buddhism. He was teaching Hinduism and calling it Christianity. The guy was just a swindler. Just a full swindler. A heretic and a swindler. This confusion of the soul and spirit, you get the same thing in secular psychology. Not to be confused with biblical psychology. Again, we've explained this. God breathed on Adam and Adam became a living soul. Somebody's soul, their consciousness, is a homogenous hybrid of what they are organically and what they are spiritually. Mental illness never originates in the mind. If somebody is mentally ill, there's either something wrong with them chemically, something wrong with them spiritually, or both. But mental illness does not come from the mind. Secular psychology is a complete hoax. It is a total fraud. It's non-quantitative. It's not even real science. Neuropsychology is, biopsychology is, psychiatric medicine is. They have an organic basis. But pure psychology, behavioral science, is not even real science. It's just pure garbage. It's absolute garbage. The advertising industry runs on it. Media runs on it. Political campaigns run on it. Education runs on it. It's about social engineering, conditioning, manipulation. But it has no scientific basis. None. No, we're three, three-dimensional. Three. How do you tell what's the spirit and what's the soul? The word of God is the surgical instrument for doing that. Don't go any further in trying to judge, evaluate, or test something if it's contrary to scripture. And so we have this idea. And it's this surgical instrument, the word of God, that's living and active is sharper than any two-edged sword. Yesterday and other times, we explained how idolatry equals adultery. Israel was to be God's woman as the church is the bride of Christ. <clears throat> Book of Hosea, daughter of Zion, you played the harlot. Book of Amos and so forth, Jeremiah. <coughs> the New Testament adopts this concept. Satan trying to take God's woman. Idolatry equals spiritual adultery. James writes about it in chapter 4 of his epistle. Jesus uses the illustration of the seductress Jezebel in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who seduces. Spiritual seduction is illustrated by sexual seduction in biblical imagery. It uses sexual seduction to illustrate the way spiritual seduction works. Turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs. Chapter 5, verse 1, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may observe discretion, and your lips may reserve knowledge. Now the Hebrew word wisdom is in the female, is feminine, chokmah. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Smoother than oil is her speech, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of she. Oh, she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She doesn't even know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. 
Do not go near to the door of her house, lest you give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Verse 9, as Samson did. He was seduced, wasn't he? The scripture always uses sexual seduction to illustrate spiritual seduction. Keep away from her house. Is that saying don't go near a bordello? Of course it is. But it's saying something much deeper. Keep away from that lunatic church. Do not go near these places. It's where the seductress is. Smoother than oil is her speech. False teachers know how to speak smoothly and convincingly. They're experts in religiosity. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Every false religion has a counterfeit of the word of God that is sharp as a two-edged sword. Peter, the epistle of Peter, writes about this. Jesus is the Logos, the Word made flesh, the Logon. Remember, the Scripture is Jesus in print. Jesus is the Scripture incarnate. Jesus is the Scripture incarnate. The scripture is Jesus in print. If you don't love the word of God, you don't love him. He is the word. But Peter says there is a pseudo logon. Again, same as logos, only a case ending difference. A pseudo logon. The watchtower is a pseudo logon. The Koran is a pseudo-logon. The Book of Mormon is a pseudo-logon. The Talmud, Kabbalah, Zohar, a pseudo-logon. Okay. A papal encyclical is a pseudo-logon. Okay. The Bhagavad Gita, pseudo-logon. They all have one. Every false religion, every cult has one. but it becomes more sinister than that. It's sharp. It's sharp as a two-edged sword. The reason people get taken in by these false belief systems is because it's sharp as a two-edged sword. It appeals, it drips honey, it's smooth speech, it entices people. The purpose-driven lie by Rick Warren is a pseudo-logon. Scripture tells people to believe you must repent. Rick Warren tells people if you see somebody living immorally or involved in substance abuse, don't tell them to repent. That's a negative message. We have to be seeker-sensitive. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life, then he'll clean them up. He directly confuses sanctification with justification. If somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. It is a pseudo-logon. It's a book of lies. Can you imagine a book written by somebody who fundamentally denies the gospel, who says he does not believe in substitutionary atonement, he does not believe in propitiation, he does not believe that Jesus had to die to pay for what we did. His name, William B. Young author of The Shack. There were thousands, just in the United States, thousands and thousands of home groups and Bible studies that instead of studying the Word of God, were reading The Shack. That book, The God Chase, is the same. There's nothing wrong with the prayer that Jabez prayed, but somebody wrote a book and turned it into a formula incantation. A pseudo-logan. Pseudo, when something is pseudo, it tries to look like the real thing. Oh, there's some truth in it. <laughs> yeah. Pseudo Logan. A pseudo Logan is sharp as a two edged sword. 
Therefore, we need something that is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. Sharper. You can put the word of God up against any of these pseudologans, and the word of God tears them to pieces. I knew a very nice lady, Pentecostal lady in Manchester, England some years ago. Nice person, I liked her. But she was into the word faith thing. And she had all the books of Kenneth Hagin on a bookshelf in her house. And she said, what's wrong with it? I said at random, take any book off the shelf. She took one off. I said, now at random, open to any page. She opened. And it said, chapter heading, faith sees the answer. I showed her in the scripture. We walk by faith, not by sight. <laughs> Which book do you want to believe? <laughs> Now it appeals to people. <laughs> the lips are honey. It's sharp. You need something sharper. Sharper. Remember, the first and foremost defense against error is a knowledge of the truth. Scripture is both proactive and reactive. Be careful of people who just go around reacting to error all the time. Again, there are people that the only way to know what they're for is based on what they're against. <laughs> Be careful of people like that. That's not discernment. They're always looking to find wrong doctrine. Don't worry. You don't need to go hunting to find wrong doctrine. <laughs> all you have to do is turn on the television. It's there. We do not define truth on the basis of error. We defined error on the basis of truth. There was one deceiver who is now dead, Earl Park. This is what he said when his sister Joan died. Well, I know, I know that seances are wrong and they're a sin, but the devil counterfeits truth, so there must be some way to talk to my dead sister Joan that's Christian. He didn't begin with truth to define error. He began with error to define truth. Benny Hinn going to the Forest Lawn Cemetery up here, up to 210. He actually goes up there to the grave of Catherine Coleman and Amy McPherson to get the anointing off the ground. <laughs> and he says the ghost appears to him. That's what he said. I, I confronted him in Hawaii, but may as well have talked to that wall. Anyway, pseudo always uh, takes people in. Let's look further. Chapter 6, verse 24, to keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her catch you with her eyelids. On account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, an adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes and not be burned? She seduces. When a prostitute goes up and smiles at somebody and says you want to date or whatever they say, does, does she really like that person? Of course she doesn't. She can't stand them. All she sees is money. She doesn't care about him. She doesn't even love herself. Well, that's how it works. We said this yesterday. Churches that teach error are spiritual harlots. And the pastors and the money preachers who lead them are the pimps. That's all. These churches that do this are the harlots and the pastors, these money preaching pastors are the pimps. That's all it is. It's just spiritual harlotry. That's all. Now while we have people who just go out and hunt for error, that's wrong. But then we have other people who say, oh, we just have to teach the truth. We'll let God deal with the error. That's not scriptural either, is it? If that's the case, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians never should have been written. Most of the Hebrew prophets never should have wrote anything. Neither extreme is right. Biblical truth is both proactive and reactive. But we begin with the proactive. First, teach the truth. If people were taught the truth, 
they would be much less vulnerable to spiritual seduction. They'd be much less susceptible to error. If people knew true doctrine, they would know for themselves why the purpose-driven lie and the shack belong in the furnace. Chapter 7, verse 5, that they may keep you from the adulteress, from the foreigner, who flatters with her words. <laughs> At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice, and I saw among the naive, I discerned among the youths, a man lacking sense. Passing through the street near the, her corner, he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She's boisterous, rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She's now in the streets, now in the squares, lurks by every corner. She seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. I paid my vows. Therefore, I've come out to meet you to seek your presence earnestly. I found you. I've spread my couch with the coverings with colored linens of Egypt, the world. I've sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. Now look at this. The man's not at home. He's gone on a long journey. <laughs> Don't worry about Jesus coming back. This happens when it gets dark, when it gets night. He's coming like a thief in the night. The bridegroom always comes for the bride in the night. Matthew 25, Song of Solomon. Work while you have the light. The night will come. No man can work. Spiritual seduction increases in the last days. Notice it's aimed at the youth. The people getting taken in by Bill Johnson with Hillsong, the youth. Now notice there's a sexual aspect to these things. These people who teach error, let's look at it. I'm, this is public knowledge now. What happened with TBN? Sex scandals, didn't it? Hush money about homosexuality. What happened with Jim and Tammy Baker? The sex scandals. Hillsong, sex scandals. Frank Houston, homosexual pedophile, and they covered it up. Pat Masidi, well, at least he liked girls. Not little boys. <laughs> Bobby Houston, unbelievable what she wrote. That thing, Christian women love sex. It was perverse. That's what they were teaching teenage girls. Notice there's always a sexual thing with these guys. Even the women who are on these TV programs, they, they look like geriatric Barbie dolls, don't they? They look like old whores. <laughs> they look like old prostitutes. That's what, there's a reason they dress like that. The reason they dress like old whores is because spiritually, that's what they represent. There's a reason they look like old prostitutes, too old for the game. That's what they look like. It's sick. Even the world makes fun of it. No, I'm not a legalist. I have no problem with jewelry or makeup and things like this. Christian women adorn yourself modestly. I'm not into the legalism thing by any means. but. They, they, they look gaudy. <laughs> Seduction. So then, how do we know what is the sharp sword from what is the two-edged, sharper sword? What is the sharp two-edged sword and what is sharper than a two-edged sword? What is the holy kiss? What is the kiss of death? God's truth. is objective. The Logan is objective. 
The pseudo logon is subjective. It appeals to people. There are home groups that do the following. They pray, they read a passage of scripture, and they discuss it. And they say, this is what it means to me. <laughs> and this is what the Lord quickened to my heart. And this is what it means to me. Everybody assigns their own meaning. Well, God may quicken a passage to your heart for your circumstances or your life or something, but it must be based on the objective doctrinal meaning. The Logos always has an objective meaning that applies to everybody. It is not subjective. Secondly, God's truth, the holy kiss, is scriptural. It's not experiential. We evaluate our experiences on the basis of what is scripturally stated. The late heretic John Wimber, an agent of the devil, actually taught the Vineyard Movement, we are cataloging our experiences to arrive at our doctrine. <laughs> That's why Chuck Smith kicked him out of Calvary Chapel. That was terrible. This is, ter this is the devil. Experiential. Again, the fruit of the Spirit is ikrete. We're told twice in the New Testament, ikrete, self-control. I remember people in Toronto, Canada, Pensacola, Florida, they were out of control. I couldn't control it. It must be God. You say, this is not scriptural. I was blessed. This is the same as the Mormons. Whenever you nail a Mormons with scripture and they can't get out of it, what do they do? I got a burning in my bosom and I testify to you. The church of Latter-day Saints is true. <laughs> That's supposed to settle everything. It all becomes experiential, subjective. Sharp as a two-edged sword. God's word is sharper. Logan. Pseudo Logan. God's word, the Logan, is indeed mysterious. There are mysteries in God's word. Things that are hidden that are there to be revealed to the faithful, to the believers. There are three primary mysteries concerning the return of Christ that the faithful church needs to know to be ready for the return of Christ. One is the mystery of the rapture. The rapture is called a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Two, the identification of the Antichrist. The mystery of iniquity. Three, Romans 11. The mystery of Israel. People who are into replacement theology don't understand the mystery of Israel. People who are pre-tribulational do not understand the mystery of iniquity. It has mysteries. God's word is... Mysterious. It is not mystical. The pseudo-logon 
is mystical. It's rooted in mysticism. If you go on the YouTube, well, I'm not telling you to do it, but you can go on YouTube and watch Bill Johnson. Oh, look at these feathers. There's the angel feathers falling down, and this is the gold dust. The Logan! It's theological. It is not philosophical. Colossians deals with this. The vain philosophies of the world. Secular psychology is rubbish. But there is scriptural psychology that is true, that understands the tripartite dimension of man. Scriptural psychology is the book of Proverbs. You want to understand human behavior, read Proverbs. Now, there's more to Proverbs than that. There's other things in Proverbs that are deeper than that, as we've seen. There's all kind of typology and so forth. But Proverbs is biblical psychology. Ecclesiastes, Kohelet in Hebrew, is biblical philosophy. If you trust in this life, if you hope, it's all in vanity. It's all in vain. Vanity of vanities. In the Vulgate, vanitas vanitatem, omnia venitas. It's all in vain. It's, you trust in this life, it's all in vain. Doesn't matter how successful you become, or powerful, or wealthy, it's all in vain. Love God and keep his commandments. <laughs> There's a better world coming, a better age coming. The philosophies of the world, they're rubbish. Now, they mimic scriptural truth. There's things that Plato said that resemble scripture. There's things that many philosophers have said. Even in the East, Confucius and Buddha said things that seem to resemble what Jesus said. But they can't give eternal life. Remember, Buddha was not a theologian. He was a moral philosopher. Confucius was not a theologian. He was a moral philosopher. They didn't teach religion or, 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 or anything spiritual or metaphysical. That Buddhism and Confucianism were religions that were invented hundreds of years after the time of Gautama and Confucius. They just were social philosophers. They were moralists, that's all. Well, there's truth in it, but they didn't claim to have the solution to death or sin or eternal life. You know, today the church is running on philosophies. The primary philosophy of the age in which we live in the Western world is consumerism. That's what they're running on. Consumer churches, there have been churches built on consumerist philosophy, the whole Heibel's thing, uh, <laughs> the Schuler thing. Well, let's look. The Logan is always exegetical, rightly dividing the word of God, taking out of it that which it says. The pseudo-logon is asegetical. Instead of taking things out that it says, they read things into it that it doesn't. You can only base doctrine on the exegetical, not the asegetical. You can only base doctrine on the inductive. Not the deductive. 
That's just somebody's opinion. I say this not by way of attack, but simply by way of stating fact. The academic patriarch, no longer alive, but the academic patriarch of free tribulationism was Dr. John Wolbert, former president of Dallas Seminary. In his book on the rapture, he admits, he admits there is no single passage anywhere in scripture that teaches a pre-tribulational rapture. <laughs> he admits it's not in there. He says it's in there only in the sense that we glean it. <laughs> but it's no, not stated anywhere. Most unfortunate. By the way, if you read the pre-Nicene Fathers, not that I'm into patristic literature as a basis of doctrine, but if you read the people in the early church who had historical links to the apostles like Irenaeus, the early Christians did not believe in pre-tribulationism. That was invented centuries later by Darby and those people. The early church did not believe such things. Let's continue. <laughs> God's Logos, is apostolic. Our doctrine comes from the apostles. It is not Patristic. It does not come from the Church Fathers. We can read the Church Fathers as historical sources, the pre Nicene ones at least, but they're not a basis of doctrine. If you were to read John Calvin's Institutes, his Bible of choice was not the original Greek or Hebrew, but the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, the Roman Catholic Bible in Latin. That was his Bible. And he reiterated continually by the authority of Augustine by the authority of Augustine Augustine had no authority Augustine was replacement theology Augustine was infant baptism Augustine said the church can use violence to convert people now he was right in his refutation of Pelagius, but that's about all I can say about him that was good. Roman Catholicism and mainstream Protestantism, Lutherans, Anglicans, Calvinists, Reformed churches, they're patristic. They ascribe doctrinal authority to the church fathers. That's where they get their doctrine. It's not what the scriptures say, it's what the church fathers said about the scriptures. That's the basis of Calvinism. And that's the basis of Roman Catholicism. It's sharp as a two-edged sword. Well, I got something that's sharper than a two-edged sword that says he's the savior of all men, especially those who believe. He does not create people to go to hell. Amen. Calvin's Institutes, pseudo Logan. Let's continue. The Logan, the holy kiss, that which is sharper than a two edged sword. Is correct. It is not politically correct. Don't we long for the days when PC meant personal computer? Jesus had no qualms 
about going against the social and religious conventions of his day. He didn't accept their presuppositions, such as the oral law, the Torah bel pay. He didn't accept it. He didn't subscribe to the popular conventions. This is a big one. The holy kiss. is doctrinal. It is not relational. Tony Campolo amended his opposition to homosexuality when the Christian mother of a homosexual who had committed suicide called him up and convinced him what a good boy her son was who took his life and motivated by compassion for this woman. That's what caused him to change his position. How many people here Ex-Catholic, put your hand up, please, former Roman Catholic. Okay. Yes, okay. Oh, I know wonderful Catholic believers who love the Lord. So what if they believe when they die they have to pay for their own sins in purgatory? I mean, we know that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, but if they want to believe that they're going to have to die in fear and pay for their own sins, we just have to love them and accept that. I know wonderful Catholic. If you love them, tell them they don't have to die in fear. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. What do you want to die in fear for? Where did Jesus compromise truth in the name of love? Because he loved, he told the truth. It sounds real nice and everything. Again, religiosity, emotionally soothed, dripping oil, sharp as a two-edged sword. Oh, I know wonderful Catholics, and they're against abortion, and they're against homosexuality, and, and they, 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 they... So what if they pray to the dead? <laughs> So what if they practice ritual cannibalism in the mass? <laughs> no. God's truth is doctrinal. The Logan is doctrinal. It is not relational. Well, let's continue. The Logan, the holy kiss, is revelation. It is not indoctrination. It's not catechetical. It's revelation. When we pray, we speak to the Lord, and we read his word, he speaks back to us. Through his word, by his spirit, he reveals these truths to us. The dangers of indoctrination are unbelievable. The Roman Catholic system of education, formulated by the Jesuits to stop the spread of the gospel on the Count of Reformation, give us a child to the age of seven, and he's ours for life. The fear and the guilt putting it into them. I've seen it with the yeshiva boys studying Hemish. They indoctrinate them as kids. This is what you believe. You don't think out. So when it comes to the messiahship of Yeshua, they don't think outside that box. Indoctrination. Indoctrination. 
There's people who believe doctrines that are not scriptural, or they may not even be sure are scriptural or not, but it's what they were always taught, so they believe it. Because that's what their pastor learned in seminary. <laughs> that's what they were always danced for. I believe it because that's what I was always taught. The fact that you were always taught it makes it the truth. We have anybody here who used to be pre-trib and they realized that was not right? Look. <laughs> they were always taught it. <laughs> the Lord sure this is not right. Truth is revelation, not indoctrination. It's not indoctrination. So it goes. Everybody see these things. Let's continue. The Logan. The Logan. Logan is intellectually defensible. It is not anti-intellectual. No, our faith is not intellectual. But it is intellectually defensible. There are empirical reasons to believe the claims of Jesus. There is an apologia, an apologetics for it. It is not a blind faith. Isaiah 118, come let us reason together. Paul says our faith is reasonable. When you look at the claims of Mormonism, it's not reasonable to believe the Book of Mormon or the Doctrines of Covenants of Mormonism, that this Quaker's living on the moon. It's ridiculous. It's not logical. It's not intellectually defensible to believe that Mohammed, who the Hadith says was a pedophile, is a greater prophet than Jesus. It's not logical. These things are not credible. They're blind faith. They require indoctrination. Our faith is intellectually defensible. Paul argued in the synagogue. He argued with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers at the Areopagus in Athens. It's not anti-intellectual. This is a big issue. Look at the end of Peter's epistle, please. Second Peter. Chapter 3. Verse 15. And regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. There are those liberals, and today there are those Orthodox Jews who have looked at the New Testament with the rabbinic eye, such as David Flusser and others, 
who have tried to, uh, High Maccabean as another, have tried to argue that Paul began Christianity, not Jesus. That the Christianity of Jesus and Peter and the apostles was one thing, Paul was the other. This obviously directly undermines that claim. Now notice what Paul, what Peter writes of Paul. Paul's a rabbi. Paul's an intellectual. He was from the school of Hillel, trained by Rabbi Gamaliel. Let Paul explain these complicated things. When we read the New Testament, we see that the second generation of leaders who God raised up, Barnabas, Paul, Apollos, were more educated than the first generation. The second generation of leaders who God raised up were more educated than the first generation. One of the problems that Calvary Chapel had is the opposite was true. Most of the second generation of Calvary Chapel preachers serve a continual diet of milk, not meat, because they don't know any meat. They don't know the scriptures as well as Chuck Smith or Paul Smith. They don't know the scriptures that well. The second generation did not become upwardly mobile intellectually as compared to the first generation. They went the opposite direction. That's one of the problems that Calvary Chapel had. That's why they only teach milk when you listen on the radio. There's never meat, there's only milk. It's okay for new milk, it's for babies, but that's all you're ever going to get. That's all they know. You don't have any peop many people there who know Greek or Hebrew or anything. This doesn't happen there. Acts 4.13. Realize they were simple and uneducated men, but they were impressed by their wisdom, recognizing them as having been with Jesus. If you have been with Jesus, you're going to get smarter. <laughs> and even educated people are going to recognize it. If you're not getting smarter, there's something wrong with your relationship with Jesus. Now people say things, it goes something like this. Oh, that's all spiritual pride and head knowledge. Jesus said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. The theologians were the scribes, the Sophrim. That's right, they were. They were experts on the text. But Jesus also said, I will send you prophets and scribes. Jesus also said when a scribe, when a theologian becomes a disciple, <laughs> he brings out of the treasury things old and things new. Paul had that background. He had that education. Now it's wrong to say because somebody has a formal theological education, that automatically equips him for leadership. That's wrong. Paul had to go spend eight years in the wilderness in Arabia, lowered out the basket, out the window in a basket. Nonetheless, when much is given, much is expected. Once somebody learns to trust the Lord and experiences the breaking of the Lord in their life and trust him instead of their intellect, then God will use their intellect. <laughs> Being a great musician, even having gone to a conservatory, Juilliard, doesn't make you a music minister. You've got to experience the breaking of the Lord in your life before you can lead worship under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Then God will use your knowledge of harmonic theory. <laughs> Being a physician does not make you a medical missionary. You have to experience the breaking of God in your life. Then God will use your medical or dental education. Having the formal education does not equip anybody for anything of itself. Initially, remember, Moses was educated in the wisdom of Pharaoh in Egypt before he was educated in the wisdom of God. The New Testament, the teaching of Jesus, never demeans formal education. Never. He said, when a scribe becomes a disciple, I'll send you scribes. I will send you people who are theologically educated. You think we would have this scripture in the English language if it wasn't for educated people? I John Wycliffe and, and, and you know, and William Tyndale, they were educated men. Erasmus of Rotterdam was an educated man. Be careful of anti-intellectualism. It is as wrong on one extreme as 
intellectual pride is on the other that you saw with the Sanhedrin. These people don't know the law, we're the experts. Both are wrong. When you see a person saying this, I'm not impressed by a seminary education. I'm not impressed by a Bible college or a knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. I've got the Spirit of God, hallelujah, and that's all I need. That's spiritual pride on the side of inferiority. When you see somebody saying, wait a minute, I've got a PhD from Dallas Seminary. I've got a PhD from Tyndale House, Cambridge. You don't know. That's spiritual pride on the side of superiority. Both extremes reflect spiritual pride. One inferiority and the other superiority. Neither one are right. Our faith is intellectually defensible. It's not anti-intellectual. And when you have unlearned people, they will distort it. You need people who can come along and say, that's not what it means in the Greek language. I once had a, a deceiver, but he was an ignoramus. To, he was drunk on spiritual pride, too arrogant to know he was ignorant. And his brother was the same as he was. And he was pushing kingdom now theology, dominionism. And his proof text was, violent men take the kingdom by force. That was his proof. And I said, I wrote in an article, wait a minute, the term there is biazomai. So you get the Greek word for rape, force your way into. The law and prophets are preached until John, then grace and truth from Jesus, and then force the way into it violently. That's the text. What it says is the Torah, the law, represented by John, shows you're condemned, lost. But then when the way of salvation comes, it's like people realize that the ship they're on is sinking. They're sailing on a sinking ship, and it's going down quickly on the Titanic, and they force their way into the lifeboat. <laughs> That's what it actually means. They know they're lost, and then they have a hope, a way to be saved, and they force their way in, desperately fighting to get a life jacket and get into the life. That's what it means. So I wrote this, and they responded, we'd rather adhere to the simple vernacular. <laughs> In other words, we can make it say whatever we want in English. Forget about what it actually means in the original language. This is no, no, no. Be careful of these people. Be careful of anti-intellectualism. It is as wrong on one extreme as intellectual pride is on the other. Let's continue. Our faith, our faith. Has criticality. Not passivity. The problem is, people don't understand what criticality means. Going back to Hebrews 4.12, living active, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide. That term, divide, in Greek is kritis. To distinguish, to discern, kritis. It's not simply a virtue or an exhortation, it's a command. They tell you, oh, you have a critical spirit. That's not biblical, that's not scriptural, that doctrine is false. Oh, you have a critical, you're judgmental, you have a critical spirit. Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> if you don't have a critical spirit, there's something wrong with you. If you're believing what I'm telling you now, just because I'm telling it to you, that's passivity. What they're doing is confusing kritis 
with Hupercrites. Now, what does Hupercrites sound like in English? <laughs> People who go around looking to find fault, looking to be judgmental. When you see people who do that, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> just believe the Koran, just believe the Talmud, just believe the papal encyclical. No. The Logan is criticality. The Logan is contextual and contextual. It is not mono textual. If you look at John 6, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, you cannot live. One text out of context. An isolation from co-text is always a pretext. The context, keep reading. The flesh profits nothing. Eight verses later. The co-text, eating is believing, isn't it? Jeremiah 15, Ezekiel chapter 2, Revelation chapter 10. Eating is always believing in context. Co-text. When Satan tempted Jesus, what did he do? Mon For it is written! Monotext. Jesus' response? For it is also written. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Shopper. Let's continue. Pure. The kiss of death. Mixture. We've explained this before in Peter. False prophets and false teachers. Okay. How do they operate? Para, next to. Sagzusin. They put truth next to error, Peter tells us. The pseudologon always puts truth next to error. They use things that are, that are true to camouflage the error. Oh, there's some truth in it. Remember, God hates the mixture. The Hebrews could not make a garment of wool and flax. Flax is man-made. The wool is something God made. Salvation only came from the Lamb. Go to Laodicea, I've been there many times, the cold springs, the hot springs, but where the two mix, what does Jesus do? Spits it out. God hates the mixture. Psalm 51 is usually mistranslated in most Bibles. It does not say, create in me a clean heart. Lev tohor brali Elohim. 
Lev tohor brali Elohim. Create in me a pure heart. Greek catharsis. No mixture. Let's look at it this way. Suppose there's a young couple who are really in love and they get engaged and they're going to get married. And they really are committed and they really are in love and they really are going to get married. But they fall into fornication before the nuptial. Would have been better to push the wedding date ahead. <laughs> well, we really did love each other. <laughs> There's a mixture. If you really did love her, you wouldn't have slept with her until you married her. <laughs> There's a mixture. I'm not saying you didn't love her. Oh, no, the mixture. Tahor. We'll be finishing shortly. God's truth, the Logan, the sharper than a two-edged sword. There's always orthodox. The same doctrines that have always been around. There is no new doctrine. Concerning eschatology in the last days, Daniel tells us there's a clearer understanding of doctrine that's already in Scripture. There's an illumination of things already in Scripture, but there's no new doctrine. That which is sharper than a two-edged sword is orthodox. It is not heterodox. You see people coming along with these new doctrines? God has shown me. <laughs> Heterodoxy. One more. The priority of the language is the scripture. Okay. Proto priority. Not retro priority. Turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, please. Some of you know this. The people returned from Babylon. Having left their mother tongue in Babylon, they now know Chaldee. The Hebrew dialect of Chaldee becomes Aramaic. They don't know the scriptures in the original language anymore. Only the Levites know it. That's all. The ordinary people do not. Verse 8. And they read from the book, from the law of God. Only old people, elderly people, and the Levites would have known it. And they read from the book, that is the Torah scroll, the Megillah, from the law of God, translating to give or explaining to give the sense so they understood the reading. There's only one verse in the entirety of Scripture which plainly, unambiguously, and exegetically speaks to the issue of translation. Only one. Something God only saw a need to state one time. The priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages. I have no problem with the King James. It's wonderful for its prose. God has used it. I have no problem with people who read the King James. 
but when people tell me a 17th century translation of a translation, a 17th century translation of a translation that does contain errors, has the priority over the original languages as the Ruckmanites teach? Or this Gail Ripplinger stuff? That woman is a fraud and a charlatan. Her master's degree was in home economics. She's an expert on cost-efficient detergents. She can't even read Greek and Hebrew. She was debunked as a fraud. Yet she upset tens of thousands of Christians with her nonsense. She was actually using Kabbalistic methods of, she didn't even know it was Kabbalah, but that's what she was doing. She was using the same Kabbalistic methods of hand, mishandling scripture. No, 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 no. The priority is on the original meaning of the original languages. I had one King James only guy in London. He was American, but he lived in London, Baptist from the South, and he was going on. And I said, all right, let's see. Read this. You read it? He said, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. That's not it. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. The right hand of Yahweh is a metaphor for the Messiah. He brings salvation by his right hand. If God can forget his purposes for Israel and Jerusalem, he can forget his son. That's what the text means. Oh no, the King James says it. <laughs> it's a waste of time talking to people like that. It's a waste of time even paying any attention to them. Easter. It says Easter, and Jesus didn't raise the dead on Easter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians says it was Yamri Shon of Hagmatzot. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is an it. The Jehovah's Witnesses love it. That's not what the, how the neuter gender is used for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. He said, He, you can't blaspheme an it or grieve an it. Yes, God has blessed and used the King James. I love it for its prose. But it's not perfect. Its translators did the best they could with the manuscripts they had at the time. It's a valid translation. It's better than the modern inclusivist ones. That's all true. I have no problem with the King James. None. But the priority is the original languages. And so we have the pseudo-logon versus the logon. The Logan versus the pseudo-Logan. We have that which is sharp as a two-edged sword versus something that is sharper. The Word of God. They kiss each other. Quite a thing. Two-edged. Grace and truth. People can speak the truth. But the grace must come from above. Hesed mishamayim nishkaf. Grace from heaven. Kisses. Amet naaretz. Titzmok. Kisses. Hesed ve amet nashkohu. It's anomanopia. The top lip is the grace from above. The lower lip is the truth from beneath. The two meet and form a kiss. That's what the Hebrew text says. Nishkahu. Hesed v'amet. You can't kiss someone with one lip. Need two lips. Grace depends on truth. Truth depends on grace. The two meet and they kiss. Chesed the Amet. Let us greet each other with a holy kiss.
in the 20th century, people began trying to say this. This, of course, is extra biblical speculation to say the least, and extra biblical speculation at its worst. We interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. It is obvious that what Ezekiel saw is what John saw in Revelation chapter 1 and in Revelation chapter 4 in the New Testament. No, it was not a flying saucer. It was obviously an angelic vision. It was a heavenly revelation. But to say that it was some kind of extraterrestrial spaceship is utterly nonsensical. That's not what Ezekiel saw. Nothing that we read in the New Testament making reference back to Ezekiel chapter 1 would indicate that. And in fact, as we read further in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel uh, is given his messages by God, references are made back periodically to chapter 1. But again, nothing that would indicate extraterrestrial life. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you, Jacob. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church. Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.